Welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is David Scobie. Can you hear me in the back? Great. Uh, I'm the Dean of the New School for Public Engagement, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's engaged lecture, uh, sorry, engaged live, not a lecture, a conversation, uh, discussion with Piper Anderson. Um, our engaged lives uh, program is a series of conversations with alumni from different schools and programs from our division, from the New School uh, of Public Engagement, that's meant to be not too formal, very conversational, and that explores with our guest um, the questions of, of what kind of work she does, um, how did she come to do it, and what difference did the New School make in, in that journey. So these are conversations that are partly about the achievements and the wonderful work that our alumni do, but as much about the journey, the twists and turns, the aspirations, complicated times, whatever, uh, of the, the story of the work and lives of, of, our, of our alumni. Um, this is the third, uh, this is the first year we've had this Engaged Live series, and this is the third of the conversations we had. The first one was with a, a member of our Board of Governors, Tony Manorino, who grew up in Hell's Kitchen and was an undergraduate uh, uh, of our division and also a, a graduate of our Milano policy program and went on to become a city official and real estate developer. Then we had the democracy activist and writer, Paul Rogat Loeb. Uh, and tonight I'm delighted to welcome uh, back to the new school Piper Anderson. Uh, Piper is uh, a performer, a, a writer, uh, a teacher, a community activist. She'll tell us more about all those dimensions of, of her work, uh, but she's someone, the, I met her last spring in, in one of our alumni council discussions, and the minute I heard about her work, I wanted, her to, to, I wanted to bring her in to this series because she brings together uh, forms of creativity and writing, uh, of, of uh, teaching, of healing, of social justice and community activism that represent the crossroads of just about everything we stand for uh, in our division. She's a graduate of our bachelor's program and was a Riggio Writing Fellow uh, in our school uh, of writing. She's a teacher now at the Gallatin School uh, at NYU, uh, where she teaches a course called Lyrics on Lockdown <coughs> that uses arts and social justice to investigate mass incarceration and its impact uh, on youth. She's also the director of education <coughs> and art, <coughs> excuse me, and artist development for young, <coughs> young audiences, New York, which provides arts and education uh, in the metropolitan uh, area. So uh, lots to talk about, lots to hear about Piper's story. As I said, our format is conversational. Uh, we want to have our guest tell her own story in, uh, in her own uh, words. Um, and we always have two of us as, as interlocutors, I won't say interviewers. I get to do this with our guests and I always invite a current student um, from the program from which our guest uh, graduated. Uh, and tonight we're lucky to have Tim Jones, who's also an undergraduate in our bachelor's program and a Riggio writing fellow in our, in our writing program. And I didn't know this until this afternoon, someone who has known and worked with Piper uh, as well, which makes it even uh, richer and, and more interesting. Tim, introduce yourself just a little bit to the audience. All right, just a little bit. Um, as David mentioned, I am a Riggio Fellow um, here at the School of Public Engagement. In addition to that, I was the editor-in-chief of 12th Street, um, the literary journal of our division as well, um, award-winning literary journal for the past year. And aside from that, I am a poet, a writer, a self-proclaimed black Long Island native, and I seek to find ways to use hip hop and poetry um, as tools of fine art to promote the engagement of culture. Sometimes that means social activism, sometimes that means education, but it always means finding a way to meet, to meet and reach people and enrich their lives in a real visceral way. Um, as David mentioned, I've worked with Piper for uh, going on a decade now, believe it or not. <laughs> and she's been one of my mentors um, and a very large inspiration to my career, both as a writer, as an artist, um, and as an activist. She 
was my big sister in the organization we worked in together called Blackout Arts Collective. And she's, she took me on my first tour and made sure my poems were memorized and that I was on time, like all of those kind of amazing and beautiful things. So today will be a great conversation and an opportunity to ask the questions that I've always wanted to know the answers to. <laughs> and thank you for bragging about 12th Street as well. <laughs> I, I, I want to take you everywhere. Um, here's the format. Um, we're going to uh, have a conversation among the three of us, or I don't know, 45, uh, 50 minutes um, about Piper's story, and then uh, open it up to you. We've got a floating uh, microphone for conversation with the group and maybe talk for a half hour more. Uh, afterwards, we have a reception right outside, so please stick around and, and talk and eat uh, and drink uh, more. Uh, and before we get started, let me also thank my colleagues uh, in the Divisional Office of the New School for Public Engagement, Sue Morris, Audrey Gray, Chrissy Roden, Vanessa Reich, and, and Pam Tillis. In fact, if everyone could, we, we could just give them a round of applause <laughs> for, for putting together tonight's program and the whole Engaged Lives story. So Piper Anderson, um, how would you describe the work that you do uh, and how did you come to do it? Mm. Um, so uh, just to start a little bit of social media um, business, um, because since we're not streaming, it could be um, interesting to open the conversation up. So if you are on Twitter and you want to tweet, um, my handle is Piper Anderson one, numeral one. Um, and Tim? I'm Pro Jones 22 and I forgot my Twitter handle because I don't live in this world. <laughs> but they, I have one, but it's kind of dormant. But there's also the new school one too. Which is, um, and so, yeah, like if there's questions or, um, or just ideas or statements of meaning that you want to kind of share with the largest, larger world, please um, help us do that. Um, so, Put that a little, okay, a little bit closer. So how do I describe my work? Um, interesting question um, so so I, I'm an artist I'm an educator I'm a writer um, I the work that I do around um, social justice more and more is about um, transformative practice and um, and creating community um, and so when I sort of think now about how I how I define those things for myself it's um, it's about creative um, <coughs> community practice um, and um, the integration of, of all of those different things uh, to create sustainable change. Um, the, the idea of transformation or sustainable change is, is something that's just a huge part of um, my work and always has been. And, um, and how I sort of began with that, that process is um, when I was, um, when I was, I started my undergrad and um, to show you just how non-traditional of a student I am at the new school, I started my undergrad in 1998 at the, at the University of Texas, um, and really just felt like you know one the university was way too big, and um, I, I didn't find I didn't really have a sense of community there that I was looking for, um, and then I found like an artistic community outside of that um, where I was you know mentored by um, folks like Sharon Bridgeforth and, and Lusqueda and um, had an incredible community community of artists that I was growing with and started writing um, and, and publishing my writings. And then um, this weird sort of um, homesickness came over me because I, I grew up in Philadelphia and I had traveled 2,000 miles away to go to school um, in Texas. And, um, and this longing um, to, to reclaim some stories of um, of the people that I knew um, growing up and um, and what they meant to me and, and then also just what it meant to be a, a black girl growing up in Philadelphia at this time. And so I wrote, um, I wrote this uh, one person show called um, Black Girl Speak. Um, and it was, it was the first time I had written a, a solo theater piece or and the second, it's only the second play I'd ever written. Um, and it was less about, you know, sort of, you know, starting this career as a theater artist 
than it was about this urgency to to tell a story and to embody a story because I was always a writer, but these stories felt like they needed to be embodied, um, and that the reclamation of them required that I embody them, and that in order to understand them, I had to had to do that. Um, and I performed the show and. I mean, I could have been just doing a ritual in my own living room because it really wasn't about so much the audience as it was I needed to, I needed to perform this and, and I, had to, I had to do it. And um, I remember doing it at a festival um, in Austin and literally just finished performing and just walked off stage. The audience stood up and were clapping and I just walked off stage. It was just like, I'm done. I needed to just get that out of my system. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I'm off. Um, and. And so that was the first piece that I had ever written. I um, only did it a few times. And then um, in the later works, it, that same sense of ritual was important, but, but it didn't have the same impact because in New York City, it's so much about the business, right? So you have to have an audience and you have to produce the work. And um, so it, it, it didn't sort of have the same impact as that first experience. But I mean, there's lots here I'm, I'm really curious about, but to begin with, what were the stories? Were they neighborhood or girlhood mm -hmm. or your your family? Yeah. What was it that made them the compelling thing for yeah. this first big project? It was. It was. It was girlhood. It was. Um, it was sisterhood. Um, it was the girls that I grew up with. It was um, this sort of the experiences of of. Um, of, of violence, um, like a violent sort of coming of age, of um, discovering yourself and or, 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 or misinformation about yourself um, as a black girl. And so it was all of those things. And it was also the realization that I got to leave, you know, and I got to go someplace else. Um, and I got to continue to sort of stretch and grow and, and figure out um, what was true for me. And, um, and then, you know, listening, um, to the stories of, of those folks who didn't get to do that. And so wanting to sort of honor, honor that and honor what they, um, the role that they played in my own journey. Did you perform the piece for the people whose stories it was? I never got to do that. I did, I did get to go back um, to Philly once when I, one of my first um, performance tours and I performed at my high school. And so, um, and I was just a few years out of high school and perform there and and that was the first time that I had performed anything related to that piece there. So it was a couple so I got to perform a couple of things but but not the full show and and I only did it a few times so it, it never really went anywhere major. So you you've I mean from the beginning you were both a writer and f a physical mm -hmm. performer embodying the and always performing or mainly performing your own yeah, you know, when I was at, what I studied at the new school was uh, creative nonfiction, primarily, and um, and that was that was always a really strong interest for me. Um, I really, I love the idea of of breaking down um, three dimensional space and time and sculpting from all of those pieces um, a story, um, finding the metaphors, finding you know um, those through lines that. Um, that are just important and significant and need to, to be highlighted. Um, and so that, that's always an interesting challenge for me in, in um, working with, with biography or autobiography um, and, and, and thinking about um, my relationship to the world around me, right? So still pretty early. I left, when I left Austin, you know, I had like a year and a half of, of college under my belt and wasn't sure if I was gonna go back to school or not and then came to, New York City, and a mentor of mine had introduced me to um, to liberation theology, and from that I, I found Paulo Freire, and I started reading Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and suddenly realized that um, okay, now I get why you know these these educational spaces have been so difficult for me. Um, I get why. Um, the lecture setting, the the test taking, the regurgitation of, of facts um, just felt, felt so deadening. Um, so schooling was hard, and yet education was something that was so important to me. Um, and, and that's kind of how I came to the new school is um, is because I read Pedagogy of the Press, and I was like, okay, and I need to find a school like that, right? Um, like I, I need to find a school where I can do that kind of learning. Can can I put a hold on? Pedagogy of the Press, because mm -hmm. I really mm -hmm. want to come back to it, but 
I, I know Tim and I talked about something today. That we did. Me wants to ask Absolutely. Um, well, considering that you've mentioned that writing was your starting point, would that be your artistic first language that you would consider? Um, yes, absolutely. Because I know that you're an artist who creates in multiple disciplines. Yeah. So I was curious if you considered yourself a writer first and as someone who creates in so many different mediums, um, what impact do the other mediums have on your creative process? Mm. Um, what impact? Wow, what a question. I knew you were going to come. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> um, so, so yes, absolutely. Writer first, always, um, you know, from a very young age and always writing nonfiction, right? Always like writing essays about why are they cow why are there cowboys and where does that come from you know just like always interested very early on in discovering the world and writing about it and using the writing as a way to understand it um and then and then when it came to performance um that became out of necessity it was sort of like you know there are certain ways in which um there's certain the story for me dictates what the medium is going to be okay. right so there's some there's some stories that um, that need to be on the page, you know? Um, and then there are other stories that, um, that need to be embodied, right? And that um, are connected to um, uh, just a greater process of, of, um, of ritual making and of, of collaboration and, and, um, and, uh, and performance that it just, just demands that, that it's performed. Um, and, and more and more, that collaborative piece has become really important to me. Um, but yeah, I think the story just dictates what the medium is going to be. So um, the Riggio student brain is spinning wheels in me. Um, so would you know at its inception or early on if you're writing a poem or a song or an essay, how do you navigate early on just that, that feeling of knowing what direction it's going to go in? Or does it take time? Hmm, um, I think. Well, I think more and more I just make the decision, <laughs> um, and um, and I kind of control the muse. I'm like, I'm writing an essay. That's what we're gonna do, um, or I'm writing a poem. And, and and but I think that it definitely impacts the way in which I'm able to communicate, right? So um, there are ways in which you know a, a poem allows me to to hide, right, and, mm -hmm. and to use this kind of coded language um, that's you know beautiful and. Um, and can take an, you know an audience or a reader on a journey, but um, you know writing an essay um, uh, it demands that I be very you know direct um, and be and, and tell the story very directly, um, and so um, so I think it just it depends on what my attention my intention is in some ways. Um, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. Mm, no. no. So there is. So I'm interested in the kind of process, um, and again, we're sort of, this is kind of you're emerging as, as an artist and someone who claimed mm -hmm. being an artist. Um, was there a point in which you said, I'm not just going to have one medium or one mm. craft. Um, who I am as an artist is, is constitutively boundary crossing. Mm -hmm. And then maybe a second question, if that, if that was true, do you, did you have to apprentice yourself in each of these crafts, or you just decided, I've apprenticed myself as a writer, I'm just going to pick up the movement or pick up the performance mm -hmm. or, and kind of you know, teach myself as I mm -hmm. go? I mean, I think it's a combination of both. So, you know, so I, 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 I really respect every single art form. I respect every single um, discipline a lot and so I, I so I've definitely committed myself to apprenticing myself and yet at the same time some of it is about um, just to finding my own voice <laughs> in, that, in that medium um, and so I think studying is important right and disciplining yourself is really important and then also um, once you have those tools you know throwing out what what's not useful and 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 crafting from it your own um, your own discipline um, and and I think I think each of them sort of came to me just kind of organically. You know, I don't, I've never been the sort of person to um, put limitations on what I can do. Um, and, I, and I attribute that to just, you know, 
um, my parents, really. Um, and so, um, and so it never occurred to me to say, well, I can't be a poet or um, unless I've done this, or I can't be a theater artist unless I've done this. Sorry, I need to ask this one more and then back to you, Tim, if you, if you want. But I mean, I would, I would love to be able to sing and I can't. I mean, I can help carry a tune, but I have singing envy. Is there not a craft that you have envy, oh, I and, and, do that? and that you feel like that's just a place I can't go. That's a bridge too. Oh cool. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's a relief. And I don't even go there. Yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. Okay. <laughs> um, and at all the time, I'm discovering things. I'm like, okay, you got that. Nope. Okay. <laughs> you know. Um, and then there is, there's even you know ways in which, and even within the disciplines that I do, before you know, um, engage that. There are, way, there are places that I see, you know, like some of my colleagues or um, some of, you know, my idols um, go to. I'm like, damn, I'm just not there yet, mm -hmm. right? Like you're, you're constantly on this journey of developing, right, your discipline. Um, and so, yeah, there's just, there's places where, you know, so for instance, I auditioned for 12 Years a Slave for um, Patsy, and I didn't get it. And when I saw Patsy on the screen, I was like, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> that is so it. interesting. <laughs> That's you, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and there's moments like that all the time where you're just like, yeah, that was not for me. <laughs> and that's okay. You know, I can stay in my lane. <laughs> that's, I love that story. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> oh, wow, that's awesome. Um, shifting gears a little bit, because we've talked a bit about your art. Is there a singular moment that made you enter into social justice work? Hmm. Oh, wow. Oh. I don't know if there's a singular moment. I, th I feel like there were, there were just like, you know, just an accumulation of lots of different moments I can, I can point to, you know? I can point to being in high school and um, having, um, we had a substitute teacher one day um, in my history class, and um, this, you know, very sort of like stern looking gentleman walks in, he has a bow tie on and a suit, and it's like crisp, um, and um, very quiet, puts on, he's like, we're gonna watch a documentary, and, um, and this is in Philadelphia in the, in the 90s, puts on a documentary, and it's a documentary about the move bombing in Philadelphia, and um, and this is you know a, a sort of a really traumatic moment in Philadelphia history where um, this um, um, black nationalist group uh, was their 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 house and the entire block on which they lived was bombed by the city of Philadelphia, um, and none of us in that class had ever heard of this. Right, this had happened you know, maybe 20 years before. We had never heard of this. So this teacher comes in, he's only there for two days, he shows us this documentary, and then at the end he says, and none of you knew this, right? And we were like, no. And we were like, well that's the point, is that people aren't gonna teach you the history that you need to know. And it's your job, to, it is your job to go and search for the truth and find the truth. And, and that was the first time that it had ever occurred to me that, that you know, in school or in any setting that there was just information that I had to really seek that I had to find, um, and that the world, you know, as we knew it wasn't, you know, you know, that there were forces and there were things that, that were at play that, um, that were unjust. Um, and then, you know, then other experiences of, you know, you know, campus organizing. I was at, you know, UT at the time when the, the big um, affirmative action fights were happening at the law school and um, was a part of founding this anti-racist organizing group there. and. Um, and then moving to New York City and attending my first like critical resistance conference and discovering, you know, learning about the prison industrial complex for the first time and seeing the connections to my own experience and the people in my community um, growing up. So, um, so it was like so all these sort of different, you know, small moments that really added up to um, just really lighting a fire under me. Um, and, and then being surrounded, finding myself surrounded by people who similarly had, you know, a strong fire um, in, in commitment to justice and, and being able to work together to do that. You 
just now you connected up Tim's question about your finding your either your voice or your commitment to social justice with um, a story about being on campus at UT. And earlier you had talked about reading Freire's book, Pedagogy mm -hmm. of the Oppressed. So talk a little bit. Uh, I'm interested that mm -hmm. your own emerging politics and your journey through higher ed seem mm -hmm. all tangled up mm -hmm. together, sometimes in good ways, sometimes mm -hmm. in bad ways. Or. Yeah. Um, so my journey into to higher ed, um, social justice, um, uh, I, you know, I've had, I think I had a love-hate relationship with the Academy for a very long time, um, which is why it took me like nine years to finally get my bachelor's degree. Um, and, and so, um, but, but coming to the new school, I found like, you know, the, the, uh, like I found a support, right? I found like faculty who were really supportive of everything that I was doing, um, both inside of and outside of school. Um, but it was so important for me that I that I be engaged outside of school, right? That I have a community outside of school where I was doing a lot of this work and where I was learning. Um, and so, um, trying to figure out the, the most direct way to answer your question. If I didn't ask that question, well, I'll just turn it into a better question. Could you, yeah? Could you ask it again? <laughs> well, I guess I'm. The, I, I think you're telling us two different, really important stories. One is about your emergence into activism, mm -hmm. which I'd love to hear more about, like yeah. who were, what was that community in New York? Okay. Uh, and the other one was, and, and then the second thread was, what kinds of educational experiences seem to block your sense of creativity mm -hmm. and, and also of social engagement, which it sounds like Texas mm -hmm. had some of that. And what was it about, about the new school experience that, that was uh, enabling, mm -hmm. um, and you can take either one of those. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so when I moved to New York, I moved to New York City um, in like January of 2001, and then um, and I moved in with um, a a, um, <coughs> a classmate that I, that I knew in Texas, and she was a part of this group called Blackout Arts Collective. Um, and she was like, you know, she was going to a meeting. She's like, hey, you should come with me to this meeting. It's, you know, this group of like artists and educators and activists. And, you know, we do all this great work together. And I think you would really like it. So you should come. So I went um, to this meeting with her. And it was at, it was at the CUNY Grad Center. And uh, all these folks sitting around the table. And, and then I realized that there was like an interview happening. They were interviewing. Um, folks to, uh, to, to run a, to facilitate a, um, an arts and activism program that they were doing at Freedom Academy High School. And somehow I ended up being interviewed for this and I was like, I wasn't there to be interviewed. I was just like sitting in the room with all these other people and they were asking me questions and I was like, yeah, and I do this and I do this and you know, and, <laughs> um, and suddenly I got a call like a day later, like, we want to hire you. And we were like, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I got a job. Um, <laughs> I need a job. Um, so, so I ended up joining the collective. That way they kind of like, you know, they recruited me or something. I don't know how it happened. Um, and then I ended up teaching this like class at a, at a high school in Brooklyn um, that was all in arts and activism and designing the curriculum is my first one of my first times um, one of my first times teaching like a full like having done had done a kind of one-off workshops um, and dr d taught drama to to, to um, pre-k um, kiddies but this was my first time working with high schoolers and, and like designing an entire like curriculum um, and it was like you know a really powerful experience that um, just solidified for me that I that I that I was committed to being an educator and then working with young people um, and then being a part of blackout um, and so Blackout did these, we would do these showcases where we'd feature, feature artists of color, and there was always a theme that was about, um, you know, some issue that was um, really connected to, you know, um, community or social justice, um, and the performances really kind of focused on that. And then we had this youth development program at Freedom, and then a year after joining Blackout, um, we started, or around the time that we, I joined Blackout, we started 
talking about the prison system. We started talking about mass incarceration. And, you know, because, you know, at, in, in the year 2000, the United States gained the distinction of, you know, incarcerating more people than any other country in the world. You know, we hit two million people in the prison system, and we were like, no one is talking about this. No one seems to care that this is happening. It's, you know, it's disproportionately impacting communities of color. Um, we need to do something. And so Lyrics on Lockdown um, was born, and it was a tour. And the idea was that um, we're going to use our art, we're going to use, you know, popular education, um, we're going to, you know, we're going to do performances and workshops, and we're going to travel all as you know as many cities as we can. Go into prison facilities, go into community spaces, and we're going to generate a conversation about how this is impacting our communities. We wanted to shift public opinion. We wanted to get people to understand that you know that there was like a huge um, you know drive to incarcerate um, <coughs> youth of color and um, to criminalize poor communities, and that something needed to happen. Um, and so the first year the tour went to two cities. At the next year we went to 16 cities. Um, and I was for the second year I was the one of the tour coordinators. You know, was on the road for five weeks. Um, <coughs> my first time organizing a tour. Um, of, I had organized a smaller tour before that. My first time organizing a national tour. Every single tour stop included um, a stop in inside of a facility. Um, a you know connection with a community organization where you'd sit down and we'd talk to them about the, the, the work that they were doing strategically around this issue. And then a public performance. Um, and we had created, we had really crafted this, um, this you know, really dynamic performance that included music and spoken word and, um, and dance and theater um, as a way. To, and, then, and then conversation with folks about you know, prisons and you know, talking to folks, like getting a sense of you know, how many people in this room know somebody that's been impacted by prisons? How many people in this room have been impacted directly? Um, and what do we do, right? What do we do about this? Um, and so that's how Lyrics on Lockdown was born. And then for five years, we toured, um, six years, we toured um, the country. And, um, and then it became a course. Um, you know, so it went from a focus on building public opinion, um, transforming public opinion, and educating people about the impact to, um, you know, wanting to shift public policy and wanting to also um, cultivate the very ne next generation of leaders who would then go out um, into the world and be a stand for justice. So, and so, and it's amazing to see how far we've come. Um, since lyrics on lockdown, you know, right? and so in terms of public opinion, in terms of the way people think about prisons and, and mass incarceration and, and um, how it impacts communities, so so that's you know so that that experience was a huge part of um, my my kind of emergence into organizing work, and so it was and it, and it immediately connected to um, to creative practice, immediately connected to education. Um, and, and, si and then since then, you know, everything that I've done has, has kind of been those sort of connections that have been there. And uh, if I've got the chronology right, those years of blackout and lyrics on lockdown were also the years in which you came back to school. I did, right. So I, you know, I've read Pedagogy of the Press because I, I was designing this program, this arts and activism program, right, right. Um, and then I was like, I need to get back to school too, <laughs> um, and saw like a, I think a subway ad for the new school, and I was like, okay, I'm going to check that out. Um, <laughs> the new school used to have some really cool subway ads. I, We've been I fighting remember. to get back in the subway. <laughs> like, good questions. You're just like, yeah, oh, okay. Um, so I, I got an application. I actually applied to um, City College got into City College, and then they want me to take a placement exam, and I was like, hell no. And then, um, <laughs> and then I applied to the new school, um, and I wrote about pedagogy of the oppressed in my application um, and how it impacted me. And, and in my interview, I remember the admissions officers being like, so, pedagogy of the oppressed, that's, <laughs> that's heavy stuff. <laughs> and so we talked, we had a long conversation about it, and, um, and it was very clear to, to me and to her that like this was a really good place for me to be, um, uh, where I could continue to grow, and 
and it was, you know, like I, I was in and out for years, you know, like, cause I was doing the tour. I was like, you know, I'm like, Tim, Tim quickly was my advisor. I'm like, Tim, I'm taking the summer off cause I'm going on the road. <laughs> I'll be back, you know, or I'm, I'm working on a book and now I have to do a book tour and I'll be back. And Tim would be like, okay. And give me something to put in your file. <laughs> and I come back and, you know, and, um, it was always really encouraging of, of what I was doing outside of, outside of school. Um, and it became sort of a part of the larger portfolio of who I was as a student. Mm -hmm. Um, and then really good at sort of, um, listening, um, really closely to what my interests were as they were constantly evolving and changing and changing majors every single semester. Um, and, um, and being really, really supportive um, throughout that process, no matter how long it took me. And then um, when the Writing Democracy program came along, that was really a thing that, that hooked me in in a major way. Um, in those last two years, I was there consistently, and I was focused, and I was in class, because you know, I was taking class with, with all these amazing writers, and, and the students who were in the program were so, um, incredibly smart and thoughtful and thinking about you know their writing and in um, interesting ways and and challenging each other in our craft um, and so that those were probably some of the most exciting um, you know semesters that I had at the new school that's um, music to my ears Tim Jones is now carrying on that same set of definitely music. um what made you choose Riggio I didn't shoot, you know, the series of thing about the new school, when I was, when I was here, um, they would choose me. They would just like choose me for stuff. Um, you know, like when it looked like I was kind of faltering, like I might, you know, not come back the next semester, suddenly I'd get a scholarship. They'd be like, oh, there's this performance scholarship for students who are performers. It's, we just, hey, it's for you. And it's like, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> and then when Reggio came around, it was like, oh, we think you should, you know, be, we're going to give you money to do this program. And I was like, okay, sure. Um, and so it, you know, whoever was paying attention to me, um, you know, Tim and other professors were clearly, you know, thinking about how to keep me here um, and, and, list, and paying attention to, you know, what I brought um, to the table as a student. Um, and so those opportunities kind of came to me. Um, and, so, and so that was a real gift. Mm -hmm. You know, sorry, Tim, you look like you're gonna go no, for it. Go ahead. I'm just struck that, that this, your story about getting the job at Black out is like mm -hmm. that story of Riggio mm -hmm. and scholarships, and it underscores, I mean, it's true that everyone has, they need to have, and I, we hope they have people who look out for them, mm -hmm. even when you don't know yourself yeah. what you should be doing. Yeah, it is true. And, and then we need, we need to do that for those who come after right. us. Now, I do have one question, and it does bring us full circle back to Blackout. Um, I went on the 2003 Lyrics on Lockdown tour, I think it was. Yeah. Um, and you were my mentor and the coordinator on that, and I remember my first visit to Rikers. Do you remember your first um, time going into a correctional facility um, through Lyrics on Lockdown? And can you take us on that journey of what it felt like to be doing all of this? Mm. Um, conversing around mass incarceration and educating um, versus being able to actually take this art and this philosophy um, and this work directly to the people that it directly affects? Mm. Great question. Yeah. Um, was it Rikers? Um, I, I think it, Rikers would have probably been one of my first you know, experiences going in. Um, but the, the experience that really kind of stands out um, for me is when uh, um, we were in Atlanta um, at Fulton uh, County Jail. And um, I remember the, all of the, it was a, a men's facility, and I remember all of the, um, and this often happens even now when I still, because I go, I go into Rikers um, every semester, and it still happens, but um, I remember the correctional officers and the administration just, you know, really sort of hammering into us that these are, you know, vicious animals. Um, don't trust them. Don't even look them in the eye. Um, I don't even know why you want to be here. And and then 
saying this over and over again, and women, be careful, like, you know, I'm rip you to shreds um, the minute you walk in the door. And walking into this, like, cafeteria kind of space and um, this group of men just sitting there quietly um, at tables and um, nodded when we came in and, you know, listened to what we had to say and um, and such a stark, you know, difference from the picture, the image that they tried to sort of paint for us of, of who these people were and um, talking to one, remember talking to one man who was like in such deep emotional, you know, pain um, because of the harm that he had caused um, and, and just held that and was like, there's nothing that I can do to fix it um, and, and was just holding um, and was okay with holding um, this deep emotional um, longing for relief, but you know, but knowing that um, that the harm he had done um, had deep impact on other people, um, and there not being any kind of way in which to resolve that, right? So no sort of, you know, an approach to transformative justice um, says that there are ways in which you know we all we all do harm, right? We all do commit acts of harm um, against each other and that there's ways in which we can hold, be, be held accountable for that and, and take responsibility for that um, and create, um, create reconciliation and recreate, um, recreate relationship um, and heal. And, and yet, you know, in our current system, that doesn't exist at all, right? There is no space for that at all um, for the most part. So that was a really important moment um, for me and thinking about, um, you know, transformation, mm -hmm. um, which is such a huge buzzword now. And, um, and yet, it's, it's so, for me, it's like I'm, I'm so committed to understanding the, the mechanics of transformation and um, how do you create sustainable change with people um, and, and, and move, you know, through those kind of uh, chasms that are created by trauma and violence. Is it hard, or, or how do you work with your students at NYU to overcome whatever it might be that would keep them from fully encountering mm -hmm. the, the folks in prison that they'll meet, whether it's fear or a certain kind of othering? Mm -hmm. or well, it's, it's self-reflection. We start, we start the course with, um, with and throughout the course, we were constantly in this in this process of self-reflection, right? So, let's name our identities, right? Let's la name the ways in which we have access to power and privilege, um, and, and let's make that transparent because that's one of the ways in which those sort of divides happen, right? Is that, you know, when we're not clear about about it, and and we're also afraid uh, to reveal it, and we're trying to hide behind it, um, that creates that divide, and yet. Um, and then also working to create within the class um, a sense of community. And then when we go into when we go into Rikers, the very first you know time we go in, I facilitate a session with the entire group that's really about building community. That's about building, um, creating within this you know the short limited amount of time that we have together um, a community of folks who. Um, can communicate e with each other across difference, um, can show up fully and. Um, and, and create and, and communicate and collaborate. You know, when you talked about that moment of discovering Paolo Freire, you also talked about liberation theology. Uh -huh. And, you know, I know from a, a little bit from our conversations and, uh, and about your work that, that healing has become an important, not just part of your practice, but way, the way that you speak about your mm -hmm. practice, which is, which kind of adds a new dimension to what we've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, you know, how, uh, you know, I'm really struck listening to you how organically and seamlessly your, your commitment to social justice and your creativity and your teaching all blend together. Mm -hmm. How did um, this, if I can call it this, the spiritual practice emerge as important mm. to that? Um, so again, back to this idea of you know the mecha mechanics of transformation. Um, so, um, so we were doing all this really great work, um, 
you know, with lyrics on lockdown, and then I had some other experiences where I got to create like similar sort of national cultural campaigns um, around civic engagement. And I was so, you know, I felt like, you know, this is interesting. Like we were doing this national work where you kind of go in, you quickly have, you know, an interaction, um, and then you exit. And it was like it just doesn't. It feels shallow, right? It doesn't feel. Um, I have no idea what the impact is once once we're gone, right. um, or if there is any impact. And and there's a way in which you know, um, we create like as artists, we can so easily get caught into this idea of just creating events, right? Or creating um, uh, environment, you know, sort of uh, these temporal events that just happen and then they go away. And it's like, oh, we did that. It's great. Um, and I want. I was like, I want the impact to be. I want to see the impact. Um, and I want. And I don't even need to see the impact, but I need to know that there's there's an impact, and I need to know that there's there's some sustainable change um, that's possible, right? Whatever the community or the group decides that that should be, that's fine. I don't I don't need to. I'm not attached to the actual result or what it looks like, but um, I need to know that there's substance to what um, to what I'm creating, and so um, and so that led me to studying. Um, lots of diff different mediums. And also, it was really important for my own growth and my own healing. Um, so beginning to study spiritual healing and you know, energy work, and, um, and then looking at um, um, the empowerment methodology, the empowerment work of Gail Straub and David Gershon, and, um, which is like very much connected to you know, like this sort of uh, neural plasticity, kind of how do you change your thinking, change your um, your way of being in the world and then change your reality. Um, and then from there, coming back to the body again, um, um, because I had a sense that there was, there was just ways in which, you know, there's certain things that you can't talk yourself out of. Um, and so studying somatics and somatics and trauma in particular and did like two years of training in that with Stacey Haynes and General Somatics. And, and so starting to put all these diff, diff, these things together with my training in applied theater, which, you know, is looking at, you know, human development and, and looking at like all of these, you know, with theater forms um, that are used to engage community and create dialogue and create social change. Um, and so putting all those things together and, and thinking about, um, um, what are the ways in which you know we create a shift in um, our ways of being um, that leads to sustainable change? Create a shift in, in the community's way of being that leads to sustainable change, and it's a conversation that I'm still very much in. It's something I think it's something that I'll constantly, con forever, um, be studying and trying to understand. But um, I feel like I've had some some great experiences in which I've had a chance to kind of test the waters at mm -hmm. least, um, particularly with like the somatics work and you know bringing that to um, to communities and and in a little bit in my class, my students don't know that they're doing it, but uh, <laughs> but I ask them to kind of check in right with their bodies and um, and to be fully present um, and to to practice. Um, um, practice with their breath and with their eyes and with um, with their way of being um, and I think I think it's so important that you know like we, we talk about changing policy we talk about changing um, you know increasing funding for 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 budgets you know for things and yet um, until we're able to change our way of being you know with each other um, none of that really matters sometimes there I mean there's some people who look on those kinds of disciplines of mindfulness and being present and say, this is at odds with social change, <laughs> because it's about, um, you clearly don't. So unpack that laugh. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> what's so interesting is that I, I belong to you know, a community in which like, folks are realizing that it's so important, right? So, in the, I, so I'm coming of age you know, in a time where um, there's like, like legalized, you know, violence against activists, right? Um, legalized violence against dissent, and people are impacted by that, and yet they want to show up and do um, really powerful work with each other, and you can't, 
right? Because what violence does and what trauma does is that it, it betrays safety and, and relatedness, right? So how are we gonna be in relationship with each other if and and work together to create social change when you know when we're when we're we can't, right? When because you know, because we've been shaped by um, the trauma that we've experienced, whether it was like, you know, you know, the police um, beating you down at a demonstration or um, coming into your home or, you know, in your community, stop and frisk, like whatever it is, um, until we show up um, and do our work in our bodies and in our, you know, in our hearts and our minds, um, none of that can, we can't really do mm -hmm. that work, it can't shift. And so there's a, you know, there's a, there's a growing sort of body of, of, of work um, and conversation around this idea of healing justice. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And, and mm -hmm. folks who, um, within um, social justice movements, who are thinking about, so um, what does it mean um, to, do, to do healing work, right? What does it mean to, um, to create spaces where healing can happen within our organizing um, communities and then within the larger communities that, that, we, that we work with as well? Um, and that's come about, it's, that's kind of, Grow, been growing over the last 10 years, this idea. Um, and then transformative practice. Like, so the, you know, the, all of the folks that I, you know, been training with in, in the somatics and trauma work, we're all working in social justice. Mm -hmm. And we're all very concerned about the fact <coughs> that, you know, that we we care about um, we care about community and we care about changing the world, and yet we can't talk to each other. And you know, and there's violence that's happening in our homes, um, and and we don't talk about that, and that's a huge contradiction to what we value. Um, and so, and so this becomes an important part of of that process. That's a great answer. Um, how has that evolution toward healing justice um, impacted? what you choose to create. Because you mentioned before that the medium um, is a choice that you make based on circumstance and based on an impetus. So how has that affected that process in terms of the stories that you choose to tell? Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm in this very you know interesting place where um, I'm trying to figure out what the story is now, like what the next story is now. Um, and I don't know. Um, I don't know what story I want to tell now. Um, I'm fine with that. It's, you know, liminal space to be in. Um, but I think that a huge sort of important through line through all of the work now is um, this piece about, you know, um, healing. And, and sometimes that looks like um, sometimes that looks like just, you know, how we ground, right? And how, we, how I'm able to be present um, uh, when I'm facilitating in a room. Um, if I'm at Rikers and my students are facilitating and I'm on the, you know, on the sort of you know, outside of the circle, um, it's because I'm holding the entire group, right? And I have to be present in order to do that. And I have to be in my body in order to do that. And I'm also holding the fact that behind me is a correctional officer who may or at any moment decide to shut everything down um, if they see something and I'm making eye contact with them and making connection with them and um, holding the contradictions of, you know, all of these, you know, all these other people that I have to go past um, in order to get to this group of young people that we want to serve. Um, and, and recognizing that, you know, the humanity of all those people. Um, and, and that piece is so, it's like a huge sort of, you know, piece of this work for me. It's like just holding contradiction. Um, and so I don't think that I can ever separate that from any aspect of the work. Like it's no mm -hmm. longer really a choice. It's just, it's just central, right? Like I can, you know, I can look at the bodies um, in a room that I'm about to, you know, facilitate and, um, and begin to assess really quickly uh, what the need is in the room, right? And maybe I gotta throw my agenda out and we gotta do something totally different um, if we're gonna be able to connect to each other. But that sense of connection has just become central and so, um, and so whatever it takes to get there is what I'll do. You know, you, I, I wanna um, give a heads up to our audience that we're going to shift to question and answers and in a second um, one last question for you um, you started answering Tim's question by th by saying you're not exactly sure what story to 
to tell next. And one of the reasons I was very much, among many, very much looking forward to this conversation is you're, if I can be ageist about it, you're the first young person uh, who's, who's, who's telling the story, which means uh, well, the first two have lots of work to do in, in the future of their lives, but you have even more. And I wonder how you think about that future. You, you've told us several times that you serendipity just came to you with really important, yeah. and you let those changes happen. Do you, now as you think about whatever is your next chapter, do you, th do you think there's this really big thing I want to achieve, or do mm. you think I'm just gonna stay in the present because this feels right and mm. see what calls out to me next? Well, I think it's a combination. You know, I have a, a you know a mindfulness meditation practice that um, has you know been central to to a central part of my practice for a number of years. And so, yes, there is this like, strong commitment to being in the present and to just trusting the universe. Um, and and also, you know, I'm 33, and I, I did have reached a place now where I'm sort of like, you know, I'm okay with not knowing um, because the minute I start, you know. Think, acting like I, I do know, um, usually I end up in going in a totally different direction. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's okay. Um, so, so I'm okay with not knowing. And I know that um, there, there are questions, like this question about you know, transformation um, is, is a long one, right? Like it's, it's a one that I'll be in for a very long time. And um, in a commitment to, um, to finding new ways to um, creatively create community and, and collaborate um, with community is always going to be a part of what I do. Um, and I want to get back to, you know, like the national, you know, the national piece. Like I want to, I want to have a deep impact in lots of different communities um, all at the same time. And it doesn't have to be me, but I want to be able to support that in happening. Um, and so I feel like that's probably what's next, right? So going back to, to that work, um, but with all of the new like skills and, and resources that I have, um, and seeing it done on a deeper level. Because at my job, you know, we have this national um, touring program. It's called Literature Life, and we adapt these um, these uh, American literature into um, plays that get performed all over the country. And um, the format is that there's a, there's a pre and post show discussion, there's a 60 minute performance. And it's so, you know, all these pieces are these incredible like conversation pieces about race and gender and class and violence and um, you know, the prison system and all these issues that, you know, that, that a, a town in the middle of Michigan gets to have this conversation um, and this this piece, this this piece of art, um, this theater piece, facilitates that conversation, right? And you know, and how, and, and so often I tell my students this all the time. It's like go back home, go back to your <laughs> little small towns, and create work there, you know, because it's so important, such an important part of of how we, you know, um, shift this like you know divisive, um, you know energy that exists in, in, the, in the country right now is that is that we go and we create um, in community or we bring art there that um, generates dialogue and that allows people space to kind of connect to each other across difference and, 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 and be okay with that difference. Um, so that's what I want to do. I want to do that on a deeper, le deeper level, however but that looks. That's a fabulous way to, to segue and to invite responses, comments, questions in the audience. I've got a mic and I'll run around and pass it around. Hey, hello, hi, I'm Michael. Um, Piper, that's, I, we went to grad school together. Yeah, we did. <laughs> and i just getting to know you better now too, so thanks. Thank um, and I always knew that you had something, some kind of embodied, you, you were closer to your body than a lot of all of us were in the program. And um, hearing you talk now, was linking things for me about places where I think we stopped in our applied theater study about healing. Uh. And, and you remember, uh, Chris would say, we're not therapists yeah. all the time. He'd always be saying, we're not therapists. Yeah, yeah fear of that, yeah. And I'm really thinking out loud, I'm not even sure if I'm asking a question, just about um, the risks and the bravery of being in higher education and looking at healing. Mm. Ooh, um, yeah. I, 
as as you were talking, Michael, I do remember. Like I remember, like you know, words that were on the no list is healing and transformation. We don't talk about that because um, mm. it can't be measured. You know, we don't talk about things we can't measure. Um, and and that's academia, right? It's like, you know, we have to be able to research it and measure it and report back on our findings. Um, and, and there's this sort of, there's all this like unknowable stuff um, that's involved in that process that, um, that we can't necessarily report on um, or measure in any, um, any way that you know makes sense uh, to uh, to an, a reader, um, and so I do remember moments where I would kind of silence. I, I would sort of censor myself um, when I was in grad school uh -huh. and not talk about um, the importance of healing or transformation and um, or what that would look like. And and yet, you know, there were all these ways in which you know the work that we were doing and the readings that we were doing. Um, really for me spoke to this idea that um, that there is a way in which this work, you know, um, in this case, the, the, the applied theater work we were doing does create um, powerful shifts and, and um, new insights that lead to sustainable change um, in someone. And, and sometimes those are things you can see and sometimes those are things that will rest under the surface for a long time until um, <laughs> until there's space for it to to blossom, um, and so I'm not scared anymore. But uh, <laughs> to talk about it, and and yet at the same time, I know that um, there's ways in which I can't always, you know, explain it or in a way that um, that everyone will get. Um, and yet, um, at least for my students, when they experience it, they're like, "Yep." wow, okay, like we spent seven hours together and suddenly I feel like I'm a part of a community and suddenly I'm discovering things about myself that I, I didn't know. Um, and so when, you, when it happens to you, I think you get it. Um, but I think, you know, it requires bravery. It really does require bravery to, to talk about these things in academia. And it's probably why I, I have one foot in academia and the other foot out and ready to run at any given moment. <laughs> Do I need to stand or I'm okay? I'm okay, okay. Um, hello, I'm Wayma. Um, very good friend of Piper and Thames as well. <sighs> Man, it's so wonderful. First, I just wanna say it's so wonderful to see you and to see um, everything that you have done because uh, just to echo for a second, um, you have always been um, an inspiration to me Thank you. Um, and it's very interesting because literally, I'm sorry, literally your words, I'm not even like pretending Freedom's Child has been running in my head the entire time, like almost the entire time. <laughs> and, and, and ironically, I was just playing this, this old CD, very old CD from Lyrics on Lockdown. I went on tour with them as well. Um, and uh, I was playing it last week. And at the minute I sat down, it started you know, some of the, the, the lyrics started coming back to me. Um, and I just want to say, I, I feel like um, everything that you've discussed today um, is beautiful. But I want to hear a couple of words, like a, a few lines of poetry, a tiny little <laughs> piece of song. Freedom's Child, if, if you want. Oh but just give that. folks a taste. Oh my just gosh. give folks a taste. That's all I want. So Freedom's Child is a song that I wrote for um, while we were on the Lyrics on Lockdown tour. Um, and it was, it was originally written for um, political prisoners. And then, um, and then I dedicated it to um, mothers in prison. Um, and actually, when I was, I was co-facilitating a um, retreat, I'm a part of um, this group called Standing in Our Power, which is a um, transformative leadership um, institute for women of color and social justice. And one of the coaches and, um, and Tage, who's also a part of Blackout, asked me to sing this song. Um, I'm just going to sing a little bit of it, just a little bit. <laughs> I fight a battle every day, trying to live righteous. And my spirit means well, y'all. 
but I can't fight this. What it takes to be whole, living free is beyond me alone to achieve. I need spirits all around me to walk this path. I need love unconditional for this to last. I need all my community walking with me. I'm dependent on each of you to speak for me. Cause I am. I am more than a revolutionary and I am more than just freedom's child and I am more than a visionary so keep me safe now family don't let me stray don't let me fall Keep me safe now, family. Don't let me stray. Don't let me fall, no. All right. <laughs> Always, if there's a blackout person in the audience, they're going to put me on the spot. You know, I was not trying to not be the one tonight. <laughs> what were you saying to him? Um, it was interesting because I was... Uh, <laughs> thinking about that song for the past couple of weeks, and I don't think I've ever told you this, but the poem that I wrote for LOL 2003, Explosion of a Dream Deferred, I wrote that after listening to Freedom's Child on repeat, probably for about mm. 16 hours in my house. Wow. So um, it's a gift you never knew that thank you gave me, you. but thank you. My pre-show music for this pre-show, I needed that, Freedom's Child. And I don't see, like that's one of those, um, those, you know, we're asking about art forms that I feel like I don't, you know, like I don't, I don't think of myself as a songwriter. That's probably the only, like I've written very few songs. Um, and that is the one that, you know, that just, you know, for that moment, whatever inspiration hit me, it worked, but otherwise I'm not a songwriter. Hi, um, my name is Safia. Piper was my favorite professor at NYU. <laughs> and I'm now a grad student at the new school. Um, and my question to you is, as kind of an artist slash basically everything else, um, <laughs> how do you find yourself making time to you know, be an artist? Do you have mm. a, a practice where you write every day? Mm -hmm. or, yeah. or you know, what do you do? How do you, how do you keep the artist side nourished, I guess? Yeah. Hi, Safia. Oh. And Safia is one of my, okay, I won't say that because I have students in the room, but <laughs> she's one of my favorite students. Um, and uh, so, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, it kind of moves in cycles for me, but, but lately um, I've, I've d devoted like a sort of dedicated two hours every morning to writing. Um, and even if it's just, you know, me writing in my journal, um, whatever it is for those two hours, I need to commit to the, the writing. Um, and then play dates. Um, I, I have a theater company called Rewrites of Passage Ensemble, and we meet once a month um, for our company meetings, but we also have these play dates where it's just, you know, we're not developing anything in particular, but we just play. You know, we just have fun and play and create, and, so, and usually something really great will come out of that. But those sort of like free, open play moments are just really also really important to my practice too. Hang on a second, let me just make sure we capture it. Hey, y'all. <laughs> so, um, I'm not gonna make my claim to fame knowing y'all for a little bit. <laughs> it's just so, it's beautiful to hear, you, to hear your experience. As an artist, my question is, um, how do you find the time? You've always struck me as a person that has found incredible balance like manages life and artistry mm -hmm. in an incredibly graceful and balanced, dignified way. Goodness. Mm. Okay. And um, so as an artist, uh, as a practicing artist myself, a visual artist, my question, my, one of my struggles has always been trying to find the balance between seeking out, finding that history, staying current, which is something you always manage to do, Constantly, I'm always like in awe. Like, how do you know this, Tim? How, how do you know this? How do you know this? And so, between the history, staying current, and your practice, finding time for your practice, 
but not create, creating in a vacuum, mm -hmm. you know, where you're just creating and locking yourself out to create. Yeah. How do you balance it mm. all? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm glad it looks like I'm doing that because that's yeah, totally. really doesn't how it feel at all. Um, um, it's hard. It's you know I don't I don't know that I, it's ever really in, ba in balance. Um, there's always something's always like you know being sacrificed. Um, I I don't know that it's even possible to to kind of balance it. Um, I I do like to think that um, there are these sort of um, I don't know, these cycles that I kind of go through, right? Where there's there's times where, um, you know, where the creativity take is front and center and I just have to create, create. Um, and then there's moments where, you know, I'm just reading and I'm just digesting or I'm, you know, at conferences or I'm just, I'm in the conversation around, you know, um, whatever issues, um, like usually around prisons and mass incarceration. Um, and or you know or where I'm at work and I'm like you know thinking about young people and I'm thinking about education and how to improve the quality of education for them through the arts um, and bringing arts into their school, and so sometimes there, there are some things that are in balance and then other, something else is you know being um, sacrificed, and and it's hard, um, but you are having to sort of make a decision all the time about what to sort of put front and center, what to prioritize, um, and I think giving up the notion that I'm gonna hold it all in balance has really made it a lot easier for me to be okay uh, with where I'm at at any given moment. Um, and I think that's probably, that's the grace, right? Like that's sort of the, it's just accepting that, you know, sometimes I'm gonna be a hot ass mess and that's okay, you know? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna be able to hold any of it. And that happens too, right? And you just have to be okay with that. Would you yeah. mind, uh, and, and if the answer's no, I'm totally good with that, talking about uh, a moment of defeat, whether it was artistic uh, or political, and how you respond to that? I mean, yeah. you've been so generative uh -huh. in different phases of your life. Yeah, you know, I thought a lot about that. I was like, they don't want to talk about failure. Hmm. <laughs> Let me think about failure. Someone who's um, failed a lot, I like hearing how other people <laughs> right. deal with it. Um, so one of the books um, that I worked on is called um, How to Get Stupid White Men Out of Office. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for the young folks in the room, you know, Michael Moore was this, is this you know, documentary filmmaker and, and, and you know, written about elect electoral politics and about um, political leaders. It's called Stupid White, Stupid White Men. And so we, being very provocative, we were like, we're gonna, we're gonna create this book about how to get stupid white men out of office. And, um, and the book is a collection of 13 case studies of how young people have been able to swing elections locally in their city or state, um, been able to get themselves or, or a progressive leader elected. Um, and so we wanted to create, after the 2000 election, we wanted to create something. We f figured we had to get young people excited about um, about electoral, the electoral system and about um, organizing a around the vote again. And so let's show them that it's being done and this is how it's being done. And then that was connected to organizing around the 2004 election and getting young people out to vote. So um, before this, I was not really interested in voting. I wasn't really interested in um, electoral organizing. Um, but my friend um, Billy Wimsat was like, you know, we gotta do this. And like Billy's like really excited all the time, really energized. Um, it's his idea. He put together this great group of folks who who wrote this book. And then the authors were also organizers. So we were on the we were promoting the book, but then every city we went to, we were also um, doing organizing trainings with young people on college campuses and um, and throughout uh, throughout the country. I was so intimidated the entire time that I was on this tour, so intimidated, because I was like, I don't know enough about this issue. I should not be the person doing this. Um, I remember, and then there was a huge backlash too, right? There's like, this is like a really kind of, you know, contested sort of moment. And so I was, I remember being at Colby College where the young Republicans protested my um, my speaking engagement there. They like put up this huge banner, was like Piper Anderson's a racist, um, don't go to her talk. And there were like flyers with Condoleezza Rice face and my name on it. it was, 
and she's a racist. Um, and then they all showed up, and I, you could tell that they were there because they all had pastel button-down polo shirts on. Um, <laughs> And, and then and realize that you know, the book is really for everyone, right? The book is about young people organizing for what they believe in, for you know, the, the things that are important to them. Um, and getting, I mean, the progressive piece was central to that. So we did all of this organizing, organized um, across the country, galvanized young people through the League of Young Voters, um, got out the vote, and we lost. And for someone who had never really been a part of a political campaign before, I was devastated. I was like, I put all this work in, and it was like, it felt like there was no way in which we were, you know, we were ever able going to beat the Bush machine, you know. And I felt extremely defeated, um, and uh, and it was a huge loss. And I never wanted to do anything related to politics ever again. And when, you know, in 2008 and um, Obama was running, it was frightening as hell, because it was just like, I can't believe in this. I cannot believe in this, because I've already, like, I've already felt what it feels like to lose. Um, and yet I think that, you know, um, what I've learned about, learned about failure is that um, as long as we don't sort of embody it, right, as long as it doesn't become a part of who you are, um, it has this way of creating a resilience and a buoyancy in you that is just necessary um, to, to create anything in, in life. So, um, so I'm thankful for that, that experience, um, uh, even though it was very disappointing. Thank you. That's actually, for me, a very joyous way to end. Um, so let's give a thank you to Tim and especially to Piper for an amazing conversation.